Hello, my name is Robert Capitalupo, and today I am joined by Ed Gillespie. Mr. Gillespie has had a storied career in Republican politics, serving as chair of the Republican National Committee from 2003 to 2005 and counselor to the president in the Bush administration. He has advised many national campaigns, most notably Mitt Romney's presidential bid in 2012, and has founded two lobbying groups during his tenure in Washington. Most recently, Ed Gillespie ran as the Republican candidate for governor in Virginia in 2017. He's currently a resident fellow at Harvard University's Institute of Politics. Ed, thank you so much for sitting down with me today. Glad to be with you, Robert. Thanks for having me. So you have had an illustrious career working in and around government. What made you want to devote your life to public service? Well, I went to college in Washington, D.C., to the Catholic University of America, and I was always fascinated by politics, but I didn't quite know how to get into it. My parents weren't really, uh, you know, kind of politically involved. We didn't have fundraisers at my house growing up and that kind of thing, although my mother was the first woman ever elected to the school board in the town I grew up in. But I went to college at Catholic U, and I was going to be a journalist so I could cover politics and be near it that way. I thought that would be interesting, and I, I had to work my way through school. And my morning job, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 7 to 10 in the morning was as a Senate parking lot attendant, parking the cars for the staff that work in the big office buildings on Capitol Hill. And that job led to a job inside one of those buildings on the House side, and that led to another job and another job. And uh, that's really how I got involved in, uh, in campaigns and working on Capitol Hill and elections. And eventually, I, you know, I got to work to be... Uh, counselor to the President of the United States of America. So it, it, uh, a lot of it is just a matter of luck. Before running for governor in 2017, you helped countless Republicans get elected to office in both your role as chair of the Virginia Republican Party and also as RNC chair. Uh, what was it like making the tra transition from the behind the scenes role to actually being the candidate yourself? It took some getting used to. It is different. And, uh, you know, when you're the candidate, you always have to be on. There's never really downtime, especially today in the digital age in which we live. And there's always a camera on you somewhere, a cell phone camera, and they have trackers and uh, people who are recording your every move and, and utterance. And uh, so, you know, it takes some getting used to. And also, you know, when you're an aide, you know, where you go into an event and you can kind of sidle off to the side and have a cup of coffee and, and have a little downtime. But when you're the candidate, you've always got to be, you know, speaking and, and uh, making your case. And so it took some getting used to, but uh, I got used to it. I enjoyed the campaign trail. I liked being out there with people. And, you know, when you're a candidate for a statewide office or really for any office, but in particular a state like Virginia, which is beautiful and, and so diverse, you know, you get to go places you otherwise never would go and you get to meet people you otherwise never would meet and uh, you know it's a great experience I wish I'd won but uh, regardless it was a great experience and I'm a better person for having for having made the run. Did you notice anything different between your uh, race for Senate in 2014 and your race for governor in 2017 uh, given that the latter of which came after the very divisive uh, 2016 presidential race? Well there's definitely there's the two Big differences in terms of the macro environment uh, in the 2014 Senate race, the Republican Party was the out of power party. And uh, there's an advantage to being the out of power party when you're running uh, in a midterm election. The opposite was true in 2017. Republicans had control of the White House and the House and the Senate. And my opponent had the advantage of, of being the out of power uh, you know, party. And, and uh, so that did affect the macro environment. There are other things, too, that had changed even in that three year period. You know, the the social media environment, uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, you know, there, it, it, there's a lot of toxicity, a uh, very toxic environment. Um, and so things have changed considerably, uh, but without a doubt, uh, having control uh, of the White House and President Trump uh, in the White House was a big factor in, in the environment in which I ran. In a recent interview with David Axelrod for the Washington Post, you noted a distaste with the current political climate and lamented the quality of candidates who are running for office. 
Um, has your time working with more idealistic young people at the Harvard IOP, uh, many of whom aspire to run for office, um, given you any more hope for the future or, or changed your view on this? Well, in the the Axe Files uh, podcast, um, just to be clear, I didn't I didn't express uh, dissatisfaction with the quality of candidates running for office. Uh, I said much of what I just said just now that the environment's very toxic, and the social media contributes to that toxic environment and. Uh, you know, it, it, it is a challenge to run in that kind of environment. And, and uh, David had asked me, would I encourage, you know, someone right. to run in, right. in this environment? And I, I said, I really, you know, couldn't do that. Um, but good people should run for office. And uh, because if good people don't run for office, then all you have is bad people running for office. And you don't want that. And so uh, the, the fact is the people I've met here, uh, the students in particular and the young people, uh, give me great cause for optimism and for hope for our future. Uh, you know, very, very bright, obviously, and and uh, but also, you know, uh, energetic and optimistic themselves, and uh, and and compassionate and passionate, and and so uh, I'm, I'm, you know, in my I guess six weeks here now, uh, I've been very, very encouraged by uh, by the students in particular. Uh, let's shift shift gears here for a moment and talk about the current state of the Republican Party. Um, so the Republican National Committee's 2012 post-mortem report advocated for more moderate positions in several policy areas, uh, most notably on immigration. Given the electoral shortcomings of more moderate candidates in the 2016 primaries, uh, was the RNC wrong to argue this? Well, look, you know, political elections, politics in general are very fluid and uh, they ebb and flow. Uh, obviously President Trump was able to, to win by, uh, you know, stringing together uh, some victories in the Electoral College that I think a lot of people did not foresee. Pennsylvania, you know, hadn't gone Republican and I don't know how long it, we used to call it Lucy with the football, you know, you think you would hope and think that, that maybe Pennsylvania may break the Republicans way. I remember working for Governor Romney in 2012 and we were in Pennsylvania in the end and you know, it didn't pan out, uh, which it ordinarily doesn't, and yet uh, President Trump was able to, to carry that. And, and then other Great Lakes states, obviously, uh, Wisconsin and, and Michigan. And so, uh, you know, everybody has a theory of the case, uh, and, and in the case of President Trump, uh, you know, they rejected that playbook and pursued a different playbook, and it worked. And uh, they were able to, to piece together an Electoral College majority in a way I think a lot of people did not foresee. The Republicans now control both chambers of Congress, the White House, and also hold a majority of appointments on the Supreme Court. Uh, what obstacles then uh, do you think stand in the way of the Republicans furthering their uh, legislative agenda? Well, obviously we're in an election year, and it's the first midterm election uh, for, for a president that historically results in if you look at the pattern between 25 to 30 losses to the uh, party in power, uh, if we have 30 losses, Democrats would gain control of the U.S. House of Representatives, and that would put an immediate halt, essentially, to a lot of uh, you know President Trump's legislative agenda and what he's hoping for. If they hold on to the to the Senate, uh, you know he'll be able to get confirmations for uh, for his appointees, his political appointees, to his cabinet. But clearly, if the House control of the House and/or Senate flips. Uh, that will stymie uh, the president's legislative agenda and, you know, pretty much almost automatically go into a, a contest for 2020 to try to, to try to break the stalemate, is my guess. Since the 2016 general elections, uh, many statewide and special um, elections, in, including your own race in Vir Virginia, have resulted in victory for the Democrats. Uh, how predictive do you think that this is uh, for the 2018? Well, returns? if you look at, uh, at my race in Virginia, um, 2017, it was really the first kind of uh, race in, you know, of, of uh, where there was a, a contested because New Jersey had a governor's race as well, but New Jersey's a pretty blue state. Virginia's gotten increasingly blue, but, but you know, it was a competitive race or at least thought to be, but the, the impact on turnout, uh, a lot of first time uh, voters on the Democratic side who'd never voted in a governor's election before turned out. 
Um, 300,000, about 12 percent of the electorate in the uh, Virginia governor's race were first-time Democratic voters in a governor's race who'd never voted in a governor's race before. And that was a sign of uh, great intensity on the uh, side of the Democratic Party. And we saw that intensity continue to play out in special elections, most recently the, uh, the race in uh, the Pennsylvania House District out in western Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania 18, where uh, President Trump carried that district by 20 points, and yet uh, the Democrat carried it in the special election. We saw a special election in Wisconsin State Senate. President Trump carried the district by 17 points, and the Democrat won it by nine. And so, uh, you know, those are canaries and coal mines, and uh, they, they are very negative harbingers for November and for the fall elections for, uh, for House candidates in particular uh, running for re-election or, or to open seats or election in Congress. And do you think that um, there is going to be any effect uh, among young voters um, that we have seen with the growing um, activism and the never again gun control movement? Do you, do you think that that is going to translate into uh, more electoral s success for uh, pro-control candidates? Well, that's certainly their strategy. And uh, I uh, am told that uh, at the uh, March uh, uh, this past weekend that there was a lot of voter registration taking place there, uh, voters being registered. Uh, the Democrats have done a very good job of registering voters, a better job, I would say, than Republicans of registering new voters, and then they identify and turn them out. And I know that that is part of the, uh, the strategy for the midterm elections is, uh, you know, to get younger voters to come out uh, and vote, uh, to get them registered, and then, and then turn them out. And uh, the issue of gun control is one of the issues by which uh, you know, the, the uh, Democrats are hoping to turn out voters, young voters in particular, in November. So then how do you think that the GOP can respond to a uh, strategy like, like that? You've got to register your own voters and, uh, and turn them out as well. And so uh, I, I would like to see the party do a better job of, of registering new voters and, and identifying them and turning them out uh, in the same way the Democrats have been doing really for, for about a decade now. Are there any key issues that y you think the GOP could could use to to get the base or uh, or independents excited about so so they turn out in higher tallies? Well, Republicans obviously are hoping that the uh, you know the the uh, better economy and improvement in the unemployment rate and and GDP growth and the stock market and the benefit of the tax relief that that's going to translate. Uh, into uh, votes in November, and I think you'll see candidates for Congress, uh, you know, emphasizing that in the races and talking about the, the benefits to the economy of, uh, of Republican policies and, and you know, uh, creating jobs and, and economic growth, GDP growth, uh, increased valuation of, of people's retirement funds and 401ks. I suspect you'll hear a lot about that from re Republicans between now and November. According to a recent Gallup poll, support for the Tea Party has fallen by 20 percent uh, since its inception in 2010. Uh, to what do you ascribe the decline of the Tea Party wing of the Republican Party? I'm not sure. I haven't really seen that data, and I, I don't know what's in the crosstabs. Um, uh, you know, a lot of times in movements uh, like uh, uh, the Tea Party movement, um, in many ways. Uh, often those new voters, we saw it with, for example, in 1992 with Ross Perot and his, and his uh, voters. You, we've seen it in other uh, movements over, over time. Uh, oftentimes those voters just get in, absorbed into the larger party. And I suspect in the case of, uh, of a lot of Tea Party uh, support, a lot of it has just been absorbed into the Republican Party in the way a lot of Perot voters were, uh, you know, uh, absorbed into the Republican Party. A lot of uh, Bernie Sanders self-identified socialist voters, uh, you know, or progressives uh, have been absorbed into the Democratic Party. In a two-party system, uh, movements like that tend to, over time, get absorbed into one or, or the other of the two major parties. President Trump has uh, faced uh, fairly sub substantial opposition in Congress from the House Freedom Caucus, um, many of uh, whom uh, came in to the Congress from the Tea, tea Party wave in 2010. Um, do you think that, that Trump's more um, authoritarian or, or big government policies, such as tariffs for 
for steel and uh, passing through the $1.3 billion spending bill. Do you think that that, um, that has sort of closed off the place in the party for, for more small government libertarian identifying uh, Republicans? Uh, you know, from what I see, I, th I think that the president still enjoys a, a lot of support from the Freedom Caucus members, and um, there's obviously division in the, in the party over tariffs, some division in the Democratic Party over tariffs as well. It doesn't break cleanly along partisan lines necessarily. Um, in terms of the, you know, the $1.3 trillion spending bill, a lot of disappointment over that, uh, uh, but it had to be passed with bipartisan support. and so. You get trade-offs, and, and, uh, but I know there's a lot of disappointment amongst Republicans about the size and, and magnitude of that. And the president himself has said that he you know, was not happy to end up signing it and, and wouldn't sign a bill like that again in the right. future. Now, now, the tariffs that President Trump uh, have pr proposed don't really seem to be in line with mainstream uh, Republican values of freer trade and uh, less government intervention in the economy. Uh, do you think that uh, Trump will face opposition uh, from uh, more mainstream re Republicans on on this uh, to to an extent where Congress actually will step in uh, and try to try to block these tariffs? Well, there's been talk of that on Capitol Hill and uh, a lot of Republicans do not support uh, the tariffs and uh, I've seen some speculation and, and some talk that uh, someone made May introduce legislation to to block the tariffs. I you know, I don't know that something like that could get through the House. Uh, you know, and I suspect it would need more than 60 votes in the Senate, which it's uh, unlikely to get. But I do think there are folks who are making that statement and, and making a stand in opposition to the tariffs, uh, in particular on the Republican side on Capitol Hill. Many Republicans in Congress, um, notably Jeff Flake and Bob Corker, uh, have been vocal critics of the president, uh, yet still tend to vote in line with him on uh, major pieces of legislation. Uh, given that neither senator is running for re-election, uh, what purpose do you think that, that this very public opposition serves? Well, I think that, uh, as you noted, they tend to, to agree with the president on on policy and, and uh, disagree with uh, tone to a certain extent and, and uh, you know, how he tweets and, and things that he says. And uh, I don't think they're unique in that regard. They may be unique in terms of how, how vocal they are uh, in that regard. But I think there are a lot of Republicans who don't agree with the president's style necessarily, but do think that it's a good thing that we lowered the corporate tax rate. It makes us more competitive uh, in the world that we're uh, you know, repealing outdated regulations that were allowing for more domestic energy uh, exploration and, and production and, you know, a number of other issues that uh, where, where people do agree with the president on, on the policy front. Uh, but that doesn't mean you have to agree with uh, everything that he tweets or says. Looking forward to uh, no, November now, uh, Mitt Romney is currently running for U.S. Senate uh, and is polling very well in, in his state, Utah. Uh, what effect do you think that his presence in the Senate will have on Washington? Well, I know uh, Governor Romney, and he's a very good man. I think he'll be a very effective uh, senator. He, he won't be your typical freshman Republican senator or Democratic senator for that matter. He'll he'll enter the, the chamber with a great deal of, of stature, not that those others you know, don't have stature, they do, but uh, to, to have been the Republican nominee for president of the United States and to have the, you know, the following that he has in the party, I, I think he'll, he'll be a very effective senator for the people of Utah if they elect him. And I, I don't think, you know, he's not, he's certainly not taking that for granted. I, I see in his social media, you know, he's working very, very hard to, to win that race. I suspect he's going to, and I think he'll be a very effective senator. What rising stars in the Republican Party are, are you most excited for? You know, there's a, a number of folks, and I hate to, you know, pick out certain individuals. Uh, I, I think Kim Reynolds, the governor of uh, Iowa, is, you know, is, is a very effective leader uh, for the people of Iowa. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Tim Scott, who came in and campaigned for me uh, from South Carolina, and I, I think he, uh, you know, has great ideas and policies uh, that often uh, get ignored or overlooked uh, by uh, Republicans. I look to, 
you know, at some of the governors, uh, uh, Doug Ducey in Arizona is an innovator when it comes to education policy, and, and uh, I think he does a very good job for the people of Arizona. So, you know, we're fortunate. Uh, we have a deep bench and, and uh, a lot of talent out there and a new generation of, uh, of leadership that's, you know, continuing uh, to emerge, and, and that gives me hope for the future. Uh, last question here. Uh, we have noted a bit that uh, over the past few years there has been some division within the party. Um, certain politicians have noted interest in perhaps uh, challenging Donald Trump in 2020 for the Republican nomination, uh, notably Governor Kasich. Uh, do you think that there will be a Republican primary in 2020? I, I just don't know. I was of the impression that Governor Kasich has said he wouldn't uh, challenge President Trump in a, in a Republican primary. I've heard some speculation that he, he may be thinking about running as an independent. Um, but I don't know. It's a little early. You know, if you're a Republican right now, you're focused on getting through these midterms and trying to hold on to the House and the Senate and governorships, and, and that's where the focus is. There'll be plenty of time, you know, for, uh, for presidential politics to come in the presidential cycle. Um, but, but right now, you know, Republicans are very much focused on trying to make sure that we keep our majorities in the House and Senate and amongst the governorships. Well, Ed Gillespie, thank you so much. Thank you, for Robert. Coming on. Glad to today. be here. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, for the Harvard Political Review, uh, this has been Robert Capitolupo. Thank you so much for watching.